Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Marilyn Shannon. And once again, we're breaking free together. So hi, how are you? I hope you're doing great, preparing for the holidays, enjoying your life, and happy you're here. And so thank you. It's an honor to have you. And I know your time is precious. So we're here today, ready to go. And before we do, I want to say hi to Amnon. Hello, Marilyn. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Well, you seem so prim and proper. You doing all right? I'm doing fine. Good. Good, good, good. Well, I'm excited for today's show. And you know, if you tuned in before, I'm excited about every show. But I almost had to stop myself today because I was so excited talking to our guests that I forgot what time it was. So anyway, <laughs> I'm really happy to be here. And you're going to enjoy today immensely. So I want to introduce our guest to you today. Her name is Daisy Hernandez. And she's written this book called A Cup of Water Under My Bed. And let me show can I'm not, can they see it? This way? No, this way. It's too light. Okay. It's a great, great book. You're going to love it. And you're going to love my guest. The insight and the, the passion. You're gonna, it's just going to be great. So let me welcome Daisy Hernandez to our show today. Hey, Daisy. Hey, Marilyn. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. I'm so excited to really get into this with you and to just... It, you know, when I read your book, it, so much of what I read came alive as I was reading it. I was like real, I was in it. And that's so, um, such a gift, you know, as an author, I, you know, to be able to give that to me. So thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate hearing that. So tell everyone about Daisy. And before you do, I just, I, I don't want to interrupt you, but I, I do want to say if any time during the show you want to call in and talk to Daisy, you can. 919-518-9773, or you can uh, communicate on Skype anytime at computers, that's plural, 2K voice, and you can join our chat, just put your name there, and say hello, and ask questions, and comment, and all that stuff. So Daisy, tell us about Daisy. Wow, where to start? I wrote a book, yeah. <laughs> um, and the memoir is a, a coming-of-age story about growing up in um, a Cuban-Colombian family in New Jersey, just outside of New York City, and and I basically I wanted to explore a lot of the experiences I'd had growing up uh, between English and Spanish, but also between um, a Cuban side of my family and a Colombian side of my family, um, the experiences, too, of growing up in a working class community and then going on to college and becoming a journalist and what that was like for me. And part of my story is also coming out as bisexual to my family. My family's pretty traditional Latina family, so I wanted to explore that, too. And so somehow I managed to write about all of that in 200 pages. <laughs> um, still not quite sure how I did that, but it's all there, very condensed. Um, and, and the book was largely an exploration of, um, I was really interested in how these larger issues manifest in our day-to-day -day lives. So, you know, it's easy to say things like immigration and class mobility and sexual orientation or sexuality, but what did that look like? in a day-to-day -day life. So, um, so that's why I chose the memoir form mm -hmm. for the book itself too. And I will say it is fascinating. And I kept looking, as I was reading the book, I kept looking at the number of the pages because the actual book is 170 some odd pages. And I was shocked because a lot of books I pick up are, you know, big books. And I was <laughs> like, how is this woman, and I'm, you know, in writing books and I'm like, how is this woman describing all of this and getting to the point and painting this unbelievable picture and still doing it in 170 some odd pages, which is, I kept looking to see if pages were being added to the book and I wasn't looking. <laughs> <laughs> so first, yeah, I think you know, my journalist background kicked in there. Yeah, but <laughs> it was conscious of word count. <laughs> yeah, but it wasn't done choppy. I mean, everything yeah. flowed. It was a great story. So first of all, start us off with the title. Tell us about the title. Yeah, so I actually had quite a different title. So the title now is A Cup of Water Under My Bed. And I had a completely different title. And my publisher, my editor actually at Beacon Press called me as the book was in production and said, might there be, yeah, well, actually what she said was, are you married to the current title? And I said to her, 
we're not married, but we're seriously engaged. We've been together a long time because as you can imagine, when you're working on a book, you have some kind of working title. So you've been living with that for quite a number of years usually. So we were not married, but in very engaged. And so she said, oh, you know, the marketing department thinks we could come up with something else. And, uh, and you know, I had heard so many so many stories of writers having challenges with their publishers and mine was just so wonderful. It was sort of the, you know, extreme opposite of all the stories that I'd heard. And my editor gave me, um, I was open to having a new title. My editor said, you know, just go through the manuscript one time, see what jumps out at you, just trust it and just send me a list. And I really took her guidance to heart. And I spent about like two or two or three hours going through the books, making a list of everything that jumped at me sent it to them and the title got picked by the marketing department <laughs> at Beacon Press. And at that point I had to do some serious thinking because it felt a little bit more like an arranged marriage, you know, because this is the, this is the title you're going to live with for the rest of your life. It just felt like a really big deal. And, um, so I did some polling of my closest 40 friends through email <laughs> to see which title they liked the old one or this cup of water under my bed. And um, it was actually pretty pretty split between the two titles, but I ended up choosing this title because it refers to a very specific section in the book where I talk about growing up, not just with my mom, but also her sisters from Colombia who were helping to raise me and other women in the community who had this very specific unnamed role. They were... They were like healers, they were like social workers, they were like um, therapists, you know, they, they sort of fulfilled a lot of social roles in the community. And so when I was a teenager and I was having, a, kind of basically having insomnia, I was having a hard time sleeping, my mother went to one of these women to consult with them about how to help me. And it's a very common practice, especially in, um, in certain areas of uh, the Cuban community, um, to put a cup of water under your bed, especially for Cubans who practice um, the religion, the Afro-Cuban religion, um, Ocha, O-C-H-A, or Santeria is a common name. So it's a very common practice that you're um, putting water under the bed to satiate the spirits that might be bothering you and not letting you sleep. Mm -hmm. And um, and so as I was thinking about, is this the right title for the book and talking with friends, um, one of my friends pointed out to me that it was the perfect title because it signaled how the women in my family and in my community were trying to take care of me mm -hmm. with the resources that they had. And what I'd love to tell you is that um, I chose the title based on that. I didn't know anything else um, beyond my own personal experience with the cup of water. When the book came out, and I was touring and going to um, different bookstores and uh, radio stations and talking about the book, all these people started coming out of the woodwork. Um, Latinas from all different communities, not just Cubans, like Central Americans, Mexicans, who were like, oh, my grandmother used to put a cup of water under my bed, and my mother used to do that, and I got the advice to do that one time when I was going through a lot of trauma in my life, and so it was really just beautiful. It's a much larger cultural practice in Latin America than I was even aware of when I picked the title, so it feels a little... A little bit like the title picked me mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems that way. And I, you know, and I'm Jewish, and, and my mother, grandmother, and everybody before her would put a red ribbon under oh. our bed or under our crib or under the car under the like the mattress of the carriage mm -hmm. to ward off any evil spirits. Oh, I love it. Yeah, so it's it's there these are beautiful beautiful mm -hmm. rituals. And, and isn't it amazing that they have survived through so much? Mm -hmm. You know, we may not always know the stories behind them, but they've continued. That just mm -hmm. amazes me. Yeah, it is. Why do you think that is? You know, I think it's um I think I think people are very resilient. Um and I would I'm a little biased here. I think women in particular <laughs> are very resilient. Um, so that I think despite, you know, di di you know, diaspora, colonization, migrations that are forced or chosen, I think, um, I think that, that the resiliency that women have is just really amazing mm -hmm. so that 
um, even if the story itself is not kept intact, ritual itself is another kind of story, right? It might not necessarily have all the words to it, but I think um, I think we know that it's it's spiritual sustenance of some kind, right? Even if we're not practicing the religion anymore, or et cetera, we've lost our own connections. Like I think I think women are. Um, you know, at the end of the day, many many of us are tasked with with the caretaking and and the survival. You know, of family, not just logistically, but also spiritually and emotionally. Mm-hmm. Um, and so and so it happens. Women make it happen. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny when you're saying that. I and I won't go into all of it, but I had just the craziest week last week. I don't know if everybody out there, but I think a lot of people have had a lot of crazy stuff happening lately. And what I said to my husband, like, just yesterday, and I was reflecting back on the week because it was great things and terrible things, and not just Mm -hmm. one or two of each. It was all week long. And what I did gather from my experience was that I can handle it. Yeah. yeah, That I can handle it, and we can handle it, you know? Absolutely. So, so Daisy, um, you made a statement, and you said social roles like these women played these great social roles how did they do that how did women take those roles on and how did they how did they know those things to do yeah i was quite fascinated by them when i was a child because they you know somehow my mother and my auntie one auntie in particular would somehow always find these women um and sometimes it was very simple because they worked or they ran what are called botanicas they're religious stores where you might go to buy a candle or something else that you need for a ritual and they would offer to um to read the tarot cards or or cowrie shells or something else like that so they would do some kind of divination um so sometimes it was getting to sometimes a lot of times it was kind of through word of mouth too like oh so and so she knows about she knows how to help with that it was sort of like it's, it was very informal but very consistent um and it seemed to me from the outside like my mother and my auntie and my father too would go to these women um for for kind of you know all sorts of things you know sometimes it was very it was actually a medical issue, you know, like my father did not trust medical doctors. Oh, my little cat wants to, that's my cat trying to come onto the show. Okay, kitty. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I'm going to help her figure out how to get off the table. Okay. (laughs) So, um, so my dad would, um, like he, he didn't trust doctors, right? He had not grown up in Cuba going to doctors, but he would trust these women um, to kind of do a diagnosis, to recommend herbal treatments of some kind. And then other times it was, it was kind of going to these women almost as if they were therapists, you know, like, like someone had, in my family had lost a job, for example. And it was to like, it was to find out if, you know, what they could anticipate in the future. So it was a little bit of a divination, but, but to me, it looked like growing up with it, it kind of looked a little bit like, sort of therapy, you know, like having someone listen to what was going on, you know, and, um, and offering you some faith, you know, and that in the sense that things would work out. And sometimes it was a little bit more like the role of a priest or, or some kind of religious leader in terms of directing you back to a ritual or some kind of spiritual practice. And, um, so I grew up very fascinated with them, especially because they did not have names attached, like, right. It it wasn't Mm -hmm. like it they weren't called curanderas or healers necessarily. And different people, depending on how they thought about these women, had different names for them. So sometimes they would be called um, brujas, which means witches, which is just a wonderful word in English and Spanish. <laughs> um, and and other times they would be called curandera, which is a healer. Or, you know, as I write about in the book, my dad would just refer to them as las mujeres que saben, which is the women who know and just kind of this broad acknowledgement that they had some kind of knowledge that he didn't have. So, um, so th- yeah, I just found them really fast and they continue, right. They just continue in all these, um, different Latina communities across the United States. Um, which, which I find incredibly amazing too, that across so many different, so many different cultures, whether it's Mexican, whether it's Cuban, whether it's Honduran, that, that these women are in the communities playing these roles is just really amazing to me. And are they still playing those roles? 
Yes. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. absolutely. Um, and young you women, pretty... young women are picking up these roles? You know, that is a great question. Um, that is a great question. I, I don't associate young women <laughs> with the role I'm just I'm just thinking about maybe the like I remember when I lived in Virginia for a year I went into the local botanica so the local religious store and um I guess she I guess this one woman in particular was younger because she looked like she was maybe in her 30s or 40s instead of like her 60s um but I think yeah I think generally I still see older women but I think it's also something it's a little bit of apprentice, right? It's something you grow into over time. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that's been my association mm -hmm. association with it. I also have to say that, you know, at this point, I've lived outside of my community for over 10 years, too. So, um, so it's a little bit different, you know, it's a little bit different to be going back as a visitor than to actually be in a, in a Latina community in the United States. Mm -hmm. it's, it's incredibly, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, night and day, it's just really different well, um, well, to be a visitor versus you live there and you're, you know, doing your grocery shopping there and living there day to day. It's very different. Wait, you, um, and I want to get into this, but I also want to remind people, 919-518-9773, give us a call. You are more than welcome to share your stories and yeah. your rituals with us, and we'd love to hear about it. Or you can connect, uh, connect with us on computers, that's plural, two, number two, K voice on Skype. So start us kind of in the beginning of where you start the book, because I think it's just, it's, it's really interesting how you lived in, kind of how it was for you living in both worlds and what that did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I decided to start, um, you know, originally when I was working on this book, I was very much just following the questions that I had about things that had happened in my life. And so each chapter is essentially a question that I'm trying to answer. But as it was for forming and becoming a book, I realized, oh, I need to start at the beginning, which is absolutely about language, um, because I grew up uh, speaking Spanish at home primarily and then of course the rest of the outside world happened in English and um, and so for me it was very confusing as I write about in the book before the age of five before I start kindergarten I had actually um, I felt like I had traveled to a lot of different places like I grew up in New Jersey but we had been to parts of New York City I had been down in Florida I had gone to South America to um, to be presented to my grandmother, and so I I didn't have a sense at that very young age of national borders or different places. These all seemed to be part of the same country, um, South America and Miami and New York and New Jersey, and in a way they are, right? They're like part mm -hmm. of this. Latin, Latina American diaspora, um, and but I but what stood out to me always is that um, that Spanish as a language um, was shared among all these places, even though it was dramatically changing as well. Um, and I document in that first chapter of the ways that my mother and I were negotiating the fact that she was speaking in um, mm -hmm. in Spanish, but I was beginning to learn more English, and she was wanting me to learn English, but that meant that I was not getting all the words in Spanish. And so there's a scene in there where I talk about being in elementary school and being frantic because I can't find the folder for school. You know, yes. you get those little folders, keep all your papers in the folder. And of course you lose the folder. And, uh, and my mother going, you know, de que hablas? Like, what are you talking about the folder? Because that's not a word that, you know, that's not a Spanish word. And so her beginning to learn a couple of words in English, um, and us kind of finding that in between play in between those two languages, finding our own ways of um, of communicating. And and as I write in that chapter too, which I think sometimes gets missed when we have larger conversations in this country about uh, you know English only kind of policies. When we have larger conversations about bilingual education, is that everyone has a very particular relationship to language. So. As I document in that chapter, my mother was very much about negotiating with me and trying to find, okay, what words can we share? What words can I learn? What words will we use in Spanish? But her, some of her sisters were very much, 
like, you know, you will learn Spanish the right way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we're going around like trying to correct me. And then um, one of my aunties who I just adore, just she just felt like I was a lost cause. Like I was only going to speak English and just don't even bother, you know. Um, so I, I think sometimes when we talk about bilingual education, we kind of forget that everyone in the family makes some different, really different decisions about the relationship that they have with the child around the language, the home language. And so, and I don't recall how you said this, but I loved how it came out. So I know mm -hmm. you can reiterate it. There was something in regards to how it, like, it was almost as though your life was in English, but your emotion was in Spanish. Oh, gosh. Um, I'm trying to remember the exact do you know sentence. I'm, do you know, do you know what I mean? It was like yeah, you were learning yeah. English, but your, and, and your world was becoming English but yet you were emotionally connected in Spanish. Yeah, I think sometimes people describe it as having a foot in both worlds, mm -hmm. but it never felt to me like I had a foot in both worlds. It felt more like I was sitting in a room and English was coming through the door and Spanish was coming through a window. Like I was in one place, mm -hmm. <laughs> but both languages were were happening, right, in my world. and. Um, and I did end up developing English for certain parts of my life. So my studies and my professional life absolutely happened in English. But then um, the Spanish, you know, just always goes right to the gut. You know, I think the language that your mother raises you in is always going to go to your gut in a really specific way. And I think that happens in English too, right? You know, or for people who are monolingual speakers, that there will be certain phrases that the people who raised you can use that whenever you hear that, it just, you know, it just gets you in, in, in your heart and in your gut in a different way than all the other words um, that might be said out there. And I think it's similar when we think about dual languages. Yeah, definitely. And yours was, was pretty descriptive. So now as far as your your mother is concerned because she's a she's a very strong figure in i mean the her historically how she um she came to the states and how i mean the emotion she had and how she just i mean she was such a wonderful role model wasn't she yeah yeah you know it's interesting that you say that because i don't always think of my parents as role models simply because they themselves felt like, um, um, I think they themselves felt like they were not always offering me a lot. Like they felt like they, they were raising me up in this country and that the country was offering a lot, but they weren't always necessarily valuing what they were giving me. Mm -hmm. um, and because they didn't speak English and to this day they don't speak English, I think they really struggled with that part of it. And they saw teachers as being role models and um, you know people out in kind of the English only world as being role models for me because of the dreams that they had for me, I think. Um, but absolutely, I think mm -hmm. your your parents always end up being role models, whether they want to be or not. Mm -hmm. And um, and my mother, you know, grew up in a family of her her mother had twelve children, um, so she grew up in quite a big family. But she was the first one to migrate to the United States. And there's a little bit she would not describe herself as being quite courageous. But um, I think it takes a lot of courage to be the one that leaves a country, you know, mm -hmm. um, and and, uh, you know, a certain streak of um, fearlessness in doing that. And so I think uh, I think I definitely take after her in that sense, you mm -hmm. know, sometimes, um, you know, for better and for worse, because sometimes maybe you need to say no <laughs> to something. Mm -hmm. But I've learned to say yes and sort of like jump and kind of think later sometimes. <laughs> So I definitely got that from her. Yeah, because sure. that's what she basically did, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly. She kind of didn't even realize how she even was, how she even, she just listened. She just took the leap of faith, took the, yeah. the money that I guess her sister gave her, right? And just yeah, came. she, um, yeah, she, you know, when she was going to school during that time, your, op your options in Colombia as 
as they were told to me was that you would either become a teacher or a nurse or you would get married, right? Like those were your options. And she didn't like any of those <laughs> <laughs> options. Um, and so she actually started working as a seamstress and she loved it. She loved working with her hands. She loved creating something. She loved making her own money. And, um, and so when she got in, a friend of hers that was working in this factory in Columbia had a chance to come to the U.S. and sent a letter inviting her, basically come on a tourist visa, which is what my mother did. My mother got a tourist visa. And in the 1970s, early 70s, this was a really big deal because the idea was that you would um, say that you were going on a tourist visa, but you would get and you would you once you got to the US you would be able to easily find work and th those were a lot of the stories that were coming back to Colombia at the time was that the classic money is growing on trees kind of thing image of the United States and and everyone in her family was was so excited because they you know she was going to be able to earn a lot more in New Jersey than she would be able to earn in Colombia and she she did um her sisters gave her the money for the airline ticket and she just took the leap without thinking, oh, wait, this means I'm leaving my mother. She was very attached to her mother and her family members. And so um, that part didn't all, you know. Yeah, that was sad. I yeah. Felt sad for her, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, and how yeah. she, you know, I've known many people who sent money back. Yeah. I never knew that they wrapped it in aluminum foil. Yeah, yeah, that's something that um, that she did back in the '70s. She would wrap the dollars um, in in aluminum foil and put them into these envelopes, and um, and they would yeah get sent back that way. So what when you look back, what what is what is a story that when you look back um, into your life as a growing up as a child and into your adult life, what is one of the stories that you um, when you look back, you go, you can look at it and go, yes, either yes, that's how I am, who I am today, or it's, it gave me something. Which story is that? Because there are so many. Oh, goodness. Um, you know, I think probably um, the story that I relay about, about my mother telling us bedtime stories and her stories were, her bedtime stories were not sort of the... Um, the typical childhood, <laughs> child nighttime stories. She would, we would lay in bed. It would be me and my sister because my dad worked at night, and the room would be um, completely in the dark. You know, a little bit of shadows. I could, I like sort of knew where the dresser was and things like that. But it would really be us in the dark with just my the sound of my mother's voice in Spanish, um, telling us the story of how she had been in Colombia when this letter came and that the, she got an invitation to come here and how everything was um, so shocking when she got here, you know, um, she was able to find work, but she missed her mother so much and that she would stay up at night crying, missing her mother. And because I was so young and like, you know, snuggling in bed with my mother, like I couldn't imagine this idea of being separated from your mom of like having chosen to leave but not necessarily feeling like it was a choice because there was so much financial mo motivations around it um and and she would also tell stories at night about you know herself going to work for the first time and coming from a very very she sheltered home and she was she, my mother is really great at creating herself as a character in these stories, right? And creating herself as like the innocent, you know, young girl who's been in this sheltered family. She's never, um, she's never, the only women she knows are women who go to church every day and are very obedient to their husbands. But when she starts working in these factories in Colombia, she's meeting women who are cursing for the first time, like not for the first time, but the first time for her. <laughs> um, and just hearing women like talk about their sex lives and she didn't know women could have sex lives. Um, so I was, sometimes I think, oh, wasn't I a little young to be hearing about this? But, um, but I think that was very critical in shaping me as, um, 
as both a journalist and as someone who writes memoir, because I think my mother was training me in the process of listening to people's stories, which is a lot of the work that you do in journalism, and asking questions, because I'd be snuggling up next to her, and I'd be like, and then what happened? And, well, what happened with that lady at the factory? You know, and asking her questions as we went along. But I think training as a memoirist, because she was creating herself as a character, and she was Kind of, she was giving shape to her life story and trying to make sense of it mm -hmm. as she was um, trying to put us to sleep and probably hoping that we would just fall asleep instead of asking all the questions that I was asking at mm -hmm. night. Yeah. But, and, and it was the same, I mean, if I remember, it was the same stories that she would yeah. share night after yeah. night. Now, and how did you, and so that's interesting in itself. Yeah, absolutely. It would always be, it was very much like hearing a fairy tale in that you knew where it was going to go and you knew who the characters were. Mm -hmm. But as a child, it still felt, it still felt very exciting each time. And each time it still felt like something different could happen, even though you knew it wasn't going to happen mm -hmm. because you'd heard the story so many times. But you were creating, but, you were creating as you went along as well. Indeed. Yeah, right? absolutely. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. And what I think it was also teaching me the incredible pleasure of um, the story wasn't necessarily, the plot wasn't necessarily changing, but sometimes the word choice would change a little bit or the emphasis would be put in a, in a different place. Um, and that would make the story really exciting too. So um, yeah, yeah, I think, you know, because I remember, I remember, it wasn't each, there was one time when she would tell us about sort of, you know, her mother, her mother not, the letters that she was writing home back to Columbia to her mother didn't actually make it mm -hmm. home. So that like for several weeks, I think, or months, her family didn't know where she was or if, or if she was okay, actually. Um, and so when that would come to the forefront, it would be like, oh my God, you know, it'd be really exciting in a different way than it had been in the previous tellings of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, that was very interesting how that uh, you know how she just kept telling the stories, and then when you got older, you just you kind of moved into the other room. Do you regret that at all? Did that, yeah, you know? yeah. As as it got older and sort of, I didn't have necessarily. I wasn't needing to be put to sleep with her. We weren't right. snuggling. Right. I wanted more independence, mm -hmm. and we were living in a different place as well. And um, and as it went on. I'm trying to remember if I wrote about this actually, but as I got older, some of the stories did change in the sense that I remember, I distinctly remember her starting to tell us the story about how she learned about menstruation as a young woman. Um, and I didn't realize at, at the time as she was telling me the story about what had happened to her, that she was basically preparing me, right? Mm -hmm. Um, for that experience to happen in my life. Um, it was only much later that I was like, oh my God, of course. <laughs> she was telling me her story because mm -hmm. when she, when that happened for her, she had no idea, you know, classic story. She had no idea what was going on for her body. Um, and it was actually her brothers who were explaining to her like, oh, you don't know what your period is. Oh, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> and, um, and they knew because of women that they were sleeping with, older brothers, you know, um, and so she learned, she, she did not learn from her mother actually. So she was, she would tell me these stories when I was older. I don't know that I wrote about this in the memoir, but it is a really kind of fascinating way that she, um, told me stories about it. And then as I, when it went, and then when I was menstruating, I was like, oh, this is what my mother told me about in the story. And it was really mm -hmm. not, um, not alarming or, mm -hmm. or strange in any way, because I feel like I had been growing up hearing about it in a way and she probably only told me that story for a couple of months mm -hmm. as she was realizing that I was getting closer right so in my much own was self. told in a story and mm -hmm. you know so uh how since the book is out and the book yeah. came out I think in 2014 if I read it correctly how have you changed since the oh. book is out gosh that's or have you changed question. Yeah, how have I changed? Oh my goodness. Um, let's see, how have I changed in the last two years? You know, what I think about first is actually how much has changed in my actual life because I've ended up in Ohio, mm -hmm. which is not a place I ever expected to live in. And so um, have I changed? Um, my circumstances have definitely changed and my home space has changed. You know, I feel like what has changed I guess has been a result of the, you know, the, 
it's it's such a strange experience to write a book, to spend so many years with the book, um, largely by yourself. I mean, I had a lot of community, a lot of people who read chapters as I went along. Um, and then of course my editor, et cetera, but it's still very intimate. You know, it's a very kind of, you know, people who know you, who you already have relationships with. Um, and so it's, it, you know, you feel one way or I felt one way. And then with the book being out in the world, I think what's been amazing is to have, to see the book having relationships with other people um, without me being involved necessarily. <laughs> so people, yeah. um, you know, this one student that I met a few months ago, she had to read the book as part of the a common read, you know, for the first year of college. There's a book that they're often assigned to read together now as a class. And she's actually an international student, so she read it living in Jordan. And she said, I related so much to your book, even though I was in Jordan, because... I go to an American school, but everything that's happening in my life, you know, is, you know, with my family in a different language. And so she really related to this experience of being almost the child of immigrants, even though she's living in her home country, but simply because of the American school. So it's just amazing to me, like the book has had its own, um, you know, journey in the world. Mm -hmm. And the change for me is basically like letting it go, you know, and just kind of like, oh, it's almost not my book anymore in a way, right? It's now sort of, of the world's book and out out there mm -hmm. in the world so it's been a lot of letting go it kind of takes on a life of its own huh yeah yeah mm -hmm. and i think for me it's a sort of you know letting go like i actually got an email the other day um from a reader who said how dare you you know hang your laundry out to dry and, and, and she was very like confrontational but as she wrote in the email she's really struggling with writing her own memoir and trying to give herself permission to tell these stories that feel very intimate. Mm -hmm. And so she wanted to really know how I had resolved that struggle within myself around telling these intimate stories. Um, so, so I feel like I've changed in the way of, I think in the beginning I was more attached to mm -hmm. the project in a way and was trying to explain to readers a lot of what my intentions had been and what I was trying to do. And now it's like, Oh, it's, just it's your experience with the book you know um but but that's so, true yeah, a lot of letting go that's very true and we have a question on the chat that i want to ask you but before yeah. i do i want to just comment about this it's very true because you can read daisy's words and see i don't care where wh where you're from what nationality what culture i don't care where you're from you will see you can just you can see through the description like clarity about life and I think it, 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 she does it in a very beautiful way. And I would really highly recommend um, you pick it up. Men, women, doesn't matter. But I really think that there's a way that she describes things that you can see yourself in a situation, whether it's in school, out of school, any of these uh, situations, occurrences she had with her tias, you know, along the way, I think is very is interesting. So Su Susiani has a question. She wants to know, how did you get published? Are you self-published? If not, how did you find a publisher? Yeah, that's a great question. I actually first sought out getting an agent. And the way that I started looking for agents was I started looking at the people around me, writers who had already published their books. And, and part of doing that, and this is what I tell my students now, which is that when you're writing your book, you're doing two things at the same time. You're writing your book and you're doing what I call making friends, which is the more um, down to earth way of saying networking <laughs> <laughs> or building the author platform. So you're making friends and that might, for me, that looked like um, I was taking workshops all the time to improve my writing. So I was making friends there. Um, I was going to writing conferences and so I was making friends there. And so I was getting to know people who were further on the journey than I was and they had agents. So I approached a couple of their agents um, not with any recommendation, but just with saying, I know you are the agent for this person and I think her work is amazing and I'm thinking you might be interested in my book. And it did not work out for me with agents. I tried about four agents and they all said the same thing, which is that they, because the book is not chronological, it's not one single story, they couldn't see it as being this sort of big 
memoir. And so they could not see selling it to a New York City publisher. And so they wanted me to try to make it a more traditional memoir. And I spent about a year and a half trying to do that. And, um, and I failed miserably. It was just, it really felt like writing a different book. It's, I already had a book that I was happy with and that I loved. Um, and so after about a year and a half, I just said, this is ridiculous. I'm giving up this way. And I'm going to go to um, independent publishers who, again, had published the work of some of my friends from my writing community. And so I began to approach them and, um, and they were interested. And I had uh, offers from two different presses. One of them was Beacon. And so I decided um, to go with, um, with them. I did a lot. The other thing that I did with that was I did a lot of research into how to pitch the book to an editor um, and so kind of how to set up my cover letter. And that was really, that was actually, I actually did not even go to my writing community. That was actually a lot of, um, Google searching, a lot of like looking at, um, Publishers Weekly, I think it was, and looking at poets and writers, you know, so we have all these industry magazines um, for creative writing, for literary writing. And so, but I also think I looked a lot at Writer's Digest, too, because they they definitely feel a lot more focused on the business end of it. So I think I had a really good um, email that outlined, you know, first how I knew about the publisher um, and that was usually related to someone whose book they had published. Um, and then I had why I thought they would be a good fit, you know, like why I thought my book would be a good fit for them and vice versa. And then I included just, um, I included at that point for me, what really helped was that I was already a journalist. And so I could say, you know, people already knew me. They already knew me from the magazine that I was editing. They already knew me from an anthology that I had co-edited that had been very successful. So I could point to those things for like, oh, hey, you know, I probably will have some readers because of this work that I've already done. And then, and then I just included like maybe two or three paragraphs um, that I thought were really compelling to describe the book that would give a sense of the writing because in all of my research that seemed to be very, very crucial in pitching to the publisher directly is that you have, um, you know, why you would already have readers who are interested in your work and, and, a, and a bit about like a, a taste of the writing directly so that the, the editor at the publishing house could get a sense of what your writing looks like before they even look at your first chapter. So that was a very good question, Susiani. Thank you so much for asking. And I just want to welcome anybody else. Still have time. Call in 919-518-9773 or partake in our chat. Just put your name near our video and you will be there. Um, so bring us to the bisexuality. Yeah, that's actually where the book began. Someone asked me one day, where did the book start officially since all the chapters can be read pretty independently of one another? And it was actually with sexuality because I felt at, in my 20s, I felt like I had no blueprint for any kind of sexuality other than heterosexuality. And I felt like I, I was definitely having, I had friends who were, um, who identified as lesbian, but I didn't relate to that story. Um, I didn't know, you know, as a young, young person that, um, that I was attracted to the same sex. I, so I didn't really relate to the experience of holding on to a secret for a long time or feeling very, very different for a long time. And so, you know, for me, writing is a way to answer big questions. And so I started writing about my experience with um, with coming to realize in college, um, like, oh, I'm attracted to women. Oh, I could be actually dating a woman. And the experiences of um, beginning to date women and, you know, all my, you know, zany little adventures and, you know, big mistakes in that arena and trying to, as I wrote in the memoir, trying to apply the lessons that my mother and my aunties gave me about relationships to dating women, um, but not very successfully necessarily. Um, and then also dating um, people who are transgender or um, not binary, you know, don't, don't identify with either male or female. And so I wrote about those experiences in there because that's sort of like another um, 
layer, right, of my own experience that I didn't feel like I had a blueprint for. Um, and so, yeah, so I wrote about those experiences too. And coming out to my family, my mother, um, when I finally came out to her saying like, you know, uh, she was actually happy because she thought I wasn't dating anyone at that point. She didn't realize that I was dating women. <laughs> um, so she was just happy to have me focus on my career until I met the magic man, I guess. And, um, and so she was quite surprised. Um, but, but also felt like it was an American thing. Like she was like, Oh, this, you know, we don't see this. This is, this doesn't happen in Colombia. And she had not been in Colombia at that point for, um, you know, for over 20 years, maybe like 25 years. Um, she hadn't even visited in 20 plus years. And so it was quite a shock for her to hear that there was, there were gay couples in Colombia. <laughs> um, and, um, and so we went through quite, you know, quite an experience with that. And, um, and with her kind of coming to a place of um, negotiated acceptance. Like she doesn't really, she doesn't want to know about it. She doesn't want to hear details, but you know, she understands that I'm bisexual and I'm very out about my sexuality. Um, so. So when you say a blueprint, is that part of being a writer and artist, the curiosity that, cause I don't know if I need, if I had to have a blueprint or even thought one way or the other, you know, you got married or you didn't get married or you went and got China or you didn't get China, but there were certain things and I didn't question, but is it part of the, the curiosity that you have as a writer that this, this, that you would be curious about sexuality or whatever? Oh, um, no, I don't think it's tied to being a writer or being an artist. Um, but I think that I think that you don't realize that there's a blueprint until you're in a situation where you don't have a blueprint, right? So, like, I think for me, I didn't realize because I was pretty much being raised in a family where it was expected that um, you would grow up and you would meet a man and you would get married and you would have children and you would live very, very close to your parents, <laughs> maybe even next door. Um, you wouldn't go too far. So th th that was sort of the expectation. That was, that was the blueprint. Um, but I wouldn't have called it that way because I wasn't very conscious of it mm -hmm. until I was realizing that I was attracted to women. And then it was like, well, how does it work now? Like, do mm -hmm. I fall in love with a woman and marry her and how are we how are we going to have a baby and are we still going to live next door to my parents and oh what ha I don't necessarily want to get married right like so even that was not necessarily part just wanting to do something other than marriage was not part of the expectation or the blueprint that I had been raised with so I think once um I think once my sexuality kind of came into question as being more complicated than what I had been raised with, then it sort of, suddenly I became really aware of like, oh, what am I supposed to do in this situation? For example, who asks who out? Do I ask the girl out? Or do I do like you're supposed to do with boys where, you know, you flirt in all these different ways until they ask you out, right? So in college, it was like even trying to figure out some of that basic, basic um, kind of etiquette, maybe mm -hmm. dating etiquette that I didn't know what applied with women but I did know what applied with boys at the time. But I think that's a, that's a really, those are interesting questions to ask. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So there's so many things I want to ask you, but again, we, uh, Susie's asking a really good question and I think it's, we should talk about your dad. Mm -hmm. So her question is, uh, you know, she wanted to know the background, his nationality of, of your dad. And, and well, we, we do know a lot about your mom, but what about your dad? Yeah, yeah. My dad um, was raised in Cuba, was born and raised in Cuba, and he fought against Fidel Castro um, and his army. So I, I, have, I have a bit about that in the memoir. And he came as a political exile to the U.S. Um, he's a little different. His situation is different from that of other political exiles, simply because mm, we kind of have a general picture that People who fled Cuba after Fidel Castro were people who had a lot of wealth. Um, and in in general, in sort of big broad strokes, that's true. There were people who um, had homes, had businesses, etc. My dad was a little different because he didn't have businesses and homes. He was uh, he was a young man. He had fought in the opposing army. So he, as I as I've been told the family stories when I went to Cuba 16 years ago. Um, 
he he needed to leave because his own life would be in danger as a as a, eventually as a political prisoner and so um that was why he left um it's not really clear to me that he actually wanted to leave but i think it was safer for him to leave and as i write about in the book he is um he struggles with alcoholism mm -hmm. um and you know was a very active alcoholic as i was growing up and so that definitely shaped the relationship that we have. He's also an, a tremendous um, worker, right? And so a lot of my ideas and feelings about my own work came through my relationship with him, especially struggling with, um, I had to reconcile that I came from a family um, where everyone worked with their hands. They were all blue collar workers, manual laborers. And then here I was going to college, working as a journalist, very much um, working in an intellectual landscape with my mind, which is what my dad wanted for me, but at the same time also put me in a situation that was so different from anything that he had known or that I had known through him, right? You know, because the kind, his relationship to work looked really different from my relationship to work. And so, um, so a lot of my relationship with my dad also became about my relationship to my work, my creative work, my intellectual work, um, and re recognizing at the same time that I'm a writer, so I still work with my hands, just in a very different way and, than, than my dad and, did. And I just, I want to say that, and I, I, again, you know, this, you know, when you look at a painting, you kind of sit back and you surmise maybe a little bit of what the artist had in mind by putting this over here mm -hmm. and putting that over there. So sometimes you don't know, but it's great when you can sit with the artist and say, is this what you intended? And, or did I misunderstand? So, or is it something else? So it's great because I can sit here with uh, Daisy and I can ask her certain questions. So one of the things I know, and it just, and I, I have one big question after this, but this question I want to ask you is, was he, um, he seemed to be supportive of you. Mm -hmm. That was the impression I got. Now, was that how it was? Yeah, yeah, I think a complicated support, you know. I think he was, um, he was really supportive in that I study. And as a child growing up, that, that I put school first. He was really supportive of that. He was really supportive of me starting my career as a writer. Mm -hmm. Um, and even more recently, he's actually been really supportive of me being, um, in a queer relationship, which is, um, you know, not something that I actually expected would happen. He's been really supportive in that way. Um, I still remember actually when I was in elementary school, no, I guess high school, I was in high school or early high school. I put a picture of a typewriter one of those electronic typewriters right. that you could do uh, erasing back in the day. Um, I put a picture of, uh, or like a cutout from the, you know, Sears catalog or something on the refrigerator. And he bought me that typewriter, you know, um, it was pretty amazing when I look back, you know, yeah. so he was definitely really supportive in that sense. Um, I say complicated support because when someone has, you know, an addiction like alcoholism, they're not completely available, right? Um, so there were a lot of ways in which he couldn't be supportive emotionally necessarily. And um, and ways that he couldn't be supportive also because, and I've come to appreciate this more in the last 10 years, um, that he couldn't be supportive because there was support that he had not received growing up. He had been, uh, his mother died um, when during childbirth or, or shortly thereafter, his father left him with, with the grandmother so he he grew up with a, a, an identity of being orphaned and and grew up not necessarily um you know feeling like he was uh be, you know being loved and held and and sort of like his relationship with language is um you know is 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 very specific to the kind of experience that he had growing up so our relationship i would say like the last 10 years has been a really fascinating one um he's turning 80 next year. So it's been really great to have this, these years together where I'm bringing new language into our relationship, like, um, just more language of cariño or caring, you know, like just, um, saying, you know, things like 
basic things like I love you and I miss you and, you know, things like that are just not words that he would necessarily use with us. And they weren't language that was used with him growing up either. So it's been really interesting to see him welcome that and, and start to use it with me as well. So it's been really, that part of it has been really, really sweet and new, really new from, from how it was growing up. And I can, you know, I think it's, it's very traditional in many yeah. ethnic uh, families because my father was, you know, similar in certain regards. I mean, he, he wasn't termed alcoholic, but I'm sure to rest in peace, I'm sure he had some, you know, the personality sometimes of that. And mm -hmm. so you, you get mixed messages, you know, yes. right? So you get the, you know that they love you. And so you know that when they buy you that, that um, um, typewriter, that it's, it, 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 it's true, it's, it's meaningful, and they do that, mm -hmm. and they want to, and then you get some other things along the way that question certain things, but you know they want you to do that. I want you to just tell me really quick, and we don't have a lot of time, but I want you to tell me how you, what, what are your feelings about things that are going on now as far as immigration, as far as all of this? I mean, you've lived, uh, I mean, if it wasn't for your parents coming here, you wouldn't be here. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Who knows? So how do you feel about what's going on now? Yeah, I've been writing about it for the Buddhist magazine, Tricycle. Um, I just wrote a piece that got posted just last week about it, and it's on my website at daisyhernandez.com. Um, I think for me, like for a lot of people uh, with the election, I can only speak for myself. Um, it was a real, it's been a real intense time of feeling unsafe. Um, just feeling really, really unsafe, and the shock is beginning to wear off. And and I, well, I, should, I should back up and say, uh, for me, feeling unsafe um, because of the language um, that Trump used during the election and some of the promises that have been made around laws, spe specifically pertaining to the LGBT community. So um, right now, you know, there might, might be laws that come back to the states and allow states to dictate whether someone can deny you medical care because they don't believe in your sexual orientation or it violates their religious principles. Um, so just a lot of things like that, um, feels really unsafe. Just, um, having, you know, someone in that position who's admitted to sexually assaulting women just as a woman makes me feel incredibly safe about being in the world. Um, I think the kind of, um, you know, I could go on and on about that, but right. just a lot of feelings of unsafety. Okay. And I'm pulling together right now with community. So I've been protesting a lot in Ohio and um, I'm beginning to really focus on love. And that's one of the things that I'm doing to nourish myself in addition to taking political action and calling my Ohio governor and all that stuff. Um, focusing a lot more on love stories, you know, not just romantic love stories, but just, you know, being around a friend mm -hmm. of mine who just had a baby and just watching her and her baby loving each other is feeling so nourishing. Um, but yeah, we have a lot of work cut out, especially. Right. I, I I wouldn't. I don't think I should say especially around immigration because it does feel like an assault across the board, re reproductive rights and um, right. immigration, LGBT, and so it's it's a lot of you know. I think mm -hmm. for me, like a lot of people, it's figuring out right now, you know, um, where to put my energy. You know, um, how to keep the balance between um, the political work and the creative writing and the relationships in my life that nourish me, but. I think moving in the direction of having more, for immigrants, having more sanctuary cities, having more colleges that declare themselves to be sanctuaries for undocumented students is really important. I think that is going to need to extend, or it would be wonderful to extend that to school districts as well, um, especially school districts um, that have um, really big immigrant communities. It's important for the communities to know that they have allies. Right. Um, for you, those of us like myself who have right, a lot of privilege. At, right. I have and and when you, you know? read Daisy's book, and I want you to just tell them where they can get your book. When you read Daisy's book, you can see that she faced some of that herself growing up, you know, you know, from teachers and stuff. So it's an excellent book. I highly recommend it. So tell everybody where they can get it and, and just, you know, coming to your website and all that kind of stuff. Do a little self-promotion now. 
Yeah. Well, I always love to tell people that you can go to your local bookstore and you can always request any book you want. <laughs> so you can go in there and say, I would like a cup of water under my bed. Can you order that for me? <laughs> and they should say yes. But of course, you can go to Amazon online or Powell's online and you can get it that way too. And um, you can see some links to um, to excerpts of the book on my website, which is www.daisyhernandez.com. Um, Salon Magazine had published some excerpts from the book, so you can see links to um, to the book on the website as well. And in, and also, I'm working on a new project, a new book, and you can see um, you can see some of that on on the website as well. And what is the title of the new book? The new book does not have a title okay. yet. I'm okay. in the very early stages, but okay. um, but it's about it's about immigration and infectious diseases. Okay. So it's um, a little bit more. It's more literary journalism at this point, and you can see that online too. Perfect. Well, I want to yeah. thank you so much for being here today. You are just a fabulous guest. Thank you. Thank you for bringing your story and a cup of a cup of water under my bed to all of us because that's it's incredible and I loved it. So I want to thank you for being here and I want to thank all of you out there for joining us today. I wish you a wonderful day and I will see you next week. Take care. Bye. You're tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section on nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Atomos.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters, CarolinaApparel.com, and DeltaForce.net.